on the green fence. Actually, yeah, sometimes this terrifies me, but then I kind of am able to shift back to my life and then something triggers me again. She was very good, very kind, uh, also very helpful, but also I could never address this kind of climate anxiety or this, my grief also for the natural world that I feel. So you don't want to give them, this is the monster. It's like, this is the monster, but this is how we are going to approach the monster. And this is what these people are doing to deal with this monster. Hello everyone, Neil here, and this is the final episode of our Climate Change and Health series. Dealing with topics from climate change to destruction um, of nature, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it can be very challenging, um, just going through the news and the news reports from around the globe sometimes. Yeah, I personally also get the feeling of being overwhelmed, powerless, it can be very depressing, and um, yeah, but then usually this feeling it tends to go away, fortunately. Uh, because I'm distracted by other things, such as my family or hobbies, etc. But um, there are people who may well be constantly afraid of the consequences of climate change and natural disasters. And today, I want to talk about climate or eco-anxiety. And joining me on Zoom now, I've got Dr. Patrick Kennedy-Williams, a clinical psychologist, and Megan Kennedy-Woodard, a climate coaching psychologist. They're both from Oxford. And together, uh, they formed the group Climate Psychologists. And they've also just written a book titled Turn the Tide on Climate Anxiety. Welcome to On the Green Fence. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Patrick, Megan, um, in the intro, I already made the point that as an environmental journalist, um, you know, even after some years, once in a while, I, I do get a feeling um, of we're all doomed. Uh, and I don't know, it can make me go kind of limp and I feel lethargic. And um, some nights, you know, I, I do have sleepless nights where I worry about the future. Um, also, when I look at my, my kids, um, which, which are quite young. But it, it usually doesn't last. It, uh, it, it does go away after a while. But uh, does this sort of you know, what I've just described, does this mean that I am sick? Well, it's a thanks for kind of being so upfront and honest right off the bat about how, how, uh, how climate change and the climate emergency is affecting you. Um, firstly, no, it doesn't mean you're sick. I mean, the, the, the absolutely the first thing to say about climate anxiety or eco-anxiety is we're not here to pathologize people's responses to what we're facing. Interestingly, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK made a position statement in late 2021, essentially saying, we don't think this should be considered a psychiatric condition. Um, we see this as a normal response to an existential crisis. Mm. Uh, and that's always been our position as well. That being said, as you pointed yeah. out, actually, this is a psychological thing that's happening and it has its consequences on us from, from a mental health perspective. Now, as you said, sometimes it kind of comes and goes. Sometimes for people it can be more chronic and enduring. The American Psychological Association described climate anxiety a few years ago, I think 2017. They called it a chronic fear of environmental doom. And although we're kind of working out as, as, as time goes on more about climate anxiety, that idea seems to have really stuck. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly doesn't mean that you're sick. No, absolutely not. This is this is a normal thing, a normal response to it to to an existential threat. You know, so you're in good company. <laughs> you just mentioned the American Psychological Association or, or the APA. Um, you know, coming up with this definition. So, I mean, we've got a definition, but there is no official diagnosis uh, for climate anxiety yet. I mean, does this make your job easier or harder? One of the benefits of it being something that um, was formally recognized would mean that there might be more funding for things like research and mental health support via insurance agencies and things like that. But we're actually already seeing that insurance agencies are seeing the real need for psychological support in this area. Yeah. Um, for a lot of people that present um, this problem with us, it's it's really impacting on their day-to-day -day life, their ability to enjoy themselves, socialize, do the work that they need to do. And that's really where we come in to support them to move from that place of paralysis uh, into sustainable action. Interestingly, I think too, it's important to, you know, it was sort of, there was the question of a long time of, is this a problem for the privileged? And recent studies have actually showed that this is something that affects anyone 
all over the world from all ages. It does really affect those younger, sort of the younger generations because it will have a greater impact on them as well as them being highly active in this space and also a sort of really normalizing the emotions that accompany this. So they really sort of led the way through this, I think. Hmm. You just mentioned some some figures there and, and that this is a global phenomenon. Um, I mean, I've got some stats in there from the US uh, that say that two thirds of all US adults have at least a little eco-anxiety. Roughly half of all 18 to 34 year olds say that stress about climate change affects their lives. But US professionals, I mean, where do you see the trend? Is this really a growth trend, given how the climate crisis is developing? I mean, just how many people are seeking professional help over this? I think it's fair to say we're still working out how to measure climate anxiety, not least because if you, know, if you took a straw poll, if you took 100 people in the street and said, you frightened about climate change, you would have a large proportion of those, a majority would say yes at this point in time. That's happening internationally. So what we have now is this, is this absolute kind of global shift of recognition, right? Everyone recognises this is, a, this is a, an emergency. But what we're not sure about quite yet is, does this translate to climate anxiety? Is that, is that what we're saying? Mm -hmm. Are we saying these people who are really frightened about climate change, do they have climate anxiety or are they really frightened about climate change? And as you pointed out in the, in, you know, when you introduced us, actually, yeah, sometimes this terrifies me, but then I kind of am able to shift back to my life and then something triggers me again, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And this is what we find is that oftentimes the pattern goes a little bit like that. But um, while researching this topic, um, also, you know, here in, in the region of Bonn and Cologne, I spoke to many psychologists. I was on the phone for a long time. I spoke to over 50 practices here, just, you know, trying to find out and get a gauge of, of how they're dealing with this. And uh, some took the aspect of climate anxiety very seriously and were saying, well, you know, great that the media get onto this now. This really is something we have to talk about and that they are registering more cases in this regard. And then there were others that were very dismissive. You know, um, it, it was quite surprising. And they, they said that people with climate anxiety would most likely, you know, suffer from anxiety disorders or depression, even without climate change. It was quite polarized within the psychological community here. Is this typical or is this, I don't know, just a Bonn Cologne bubble where the psychologists are a bit different? <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's in some ways possibly a sort of microcosm example of the debate that's, that, that, is, that has been happening. You touched on something there, which is an important one, which is, is this kind of something that is categorically different, right, to other forms of anxiety or other forms of psychological distress that people might experience? Is this just the same thing, but with a different trigger? You know, if someone has health anxiety, they're triggered by the threat of illness right and people someone has social anxiety they might be triggered by the threat of social situations etc people say is is this just sort of anxiety repackaged and i think the few things to consider about that i mean obviously we work with a lot of people who who would argue very strongly this is this is its own distinct thing it doesn't mean of course that people might not have you know be experiencing anxiety in other areas of their lives as well but there's there, there does seem to be something distinct about about climate anxiety in the sense that it doesn't just, when we're talking about climate anxiety, we're not just talking about anxiety, we're talking about, as you mentioned earlier, kind of you described feeling sort of lethargic, powerless, angry, uh, sort of guilt around around people's lifestyles, mm. you know. I think, I think another thing to touch on is um, there was a, the Avast study done in 21 of uh, younger people uh, sort of across the world and their experience of climate anxiety. And what we know is that... Um, the closer people are to um, either knowledge or direct impacts of climate change, the more likely they are to experience climate anxiety. And so um, as there's increasing natural disaster, it's very likely that that will be correlated with an increase in eco-anxiety and climate anxiety. And that's not to say that those people already have pre-existing mental health problems, but it's something that can impact people globally and has the potential to increase. But it's worth just spending a moment just broadening our understanding of the psychological impacts of climate change. Because actually, if you look at areas directly affected by extreme weather events in a, in a very localized way, what you see are sort of higher rates of depression, anxiety, trauma, like PTSD, and then kind of secondary mental health consequences in those areas as well, like higher rates of substance abuse, higher rates of domestic violence even. So there's, if you like, the direct mental health consequences of 
the exposure to extreme weather events. And that's that's been documented all around the world. So we need to be preparing as mental health infrastructure and mental health systems. We need to be prepared to be able to work effectively with people right? in the anticipation this is going to increase from a psychological perspective, according to how, how increased weather events are happening as well. Okay, let's just leave Patrick and Megan there for a bit. We'll be hearing more from them later, especially how eco-anxiety can be harnessed and used for something positive. But first, I'd like to bring in Boris Forkel here. He's a 42-year-old environmentalist from Heidelberg in southwestern Germany who says he suffered from eco-anxiety from an early age but felt that he was never taken seriously by his therapists. And uh, this also ties in a bit with what I mentioned to Patrick and Megan about how some psychologists here in the Cologne-Bonn area, well, they they pretty much shut me down when I approached them about how they viewed eco-anxiety or whether they had more patients approaching them about this. Anyway, so I spoke to Boris earlier to find out uh, more about him and his psychological struggle, and I'm very grateful that he took the time because his wife uh, was actually scheduled to give birth um, to a baby girl uh, that very same week. I've been already as a child somehow i've been very close to nature and my mother was very green i think i was six years old i remember we had the greenpeace magazine at home so these images from the magazines um, of for example whale capture or rainforest burning and all that stuff that stuck in my childish mind and and what about and, the climate yeah. cl- what about the climate crisis was was that already on your radar then no back in the in the 80s it was not so i didn't know about that until the 90s i think mm-hmm. the climate crisis came into um, my mind too and of course this is another very big thing yeah and people are very anxious about it but in my view, it's only the top of a culture that is really destroying um, its surroundings and the planet for quite a while. So climate change is just the latest thing that we see happening. So the climate crisis isn't something that you know made you suffer f- more from eco-anxiety? You already had it before then? Yes. So I went through my 20s with severe depression um, because... This culture didn't make really sense for me. So I was supposed to study, to make my career, to educate myself, well, to become a functional part of the system. Mm. But I understood at some point that the system itself is its not functioning um, in a good way because it's apparently very destructive. And the first a bit more radical account I came across was Serge Latouche, a French uh, writer. He wrote a book, The Westernization of the World is the title. And I read that book and I remember that he described the West as kind of a big, gigantic machine, a mega machine that is just running and running. There's nobody really in charge anymore. Technology itself is in charge because it becomes a self perpetuating machine and it's always running and doing what it's programmed to which is in capitalism of course it's um, maximizing of of profit by any means and that's what it does Mm -hmm. if i understand it correctly you felt trapped in a system that uh, was destroying the world and you didn't want to be any part of it anymore i mean how did this express itself what what kind of symptoms did you have where you sort of felt okay I, i really need this to see somebody about this this is a problem Yes, I probably needed to see somebody long, um, already long ago in the, my 20s, but I didn't. And I was still well functioning in a way. So I could finish my studies and do my degree and do my diploma and all of that. But later, when my girlfriend was pregnant and we were about to have a child, and then I was just overwhelmed with this responsibility and I... I just um, fell into a very deep depression. And then I decided, okay, now it's not only about me, it's just also about my son and I I have to do something. So I started going to therapy Mm -hmm. and that was very good. It helped me a lot to understand um, my family patterns, but it did not help me with my understanding that this culture is 
insane and destroying everything. And also uh, their climate anxiety is part of that. It became more and more uh, obvious that uh, climate change is happening and it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. But I realized that I cannot address this topic in therapy because my therapist, he will he would also always try to direct the discussion towards myself, my inner feelings, but uh, never the larger system, the societal system or the political system or anything like that. With, with your first therapist, if he you know, didn't have the tools or the mindset to actually address this with you, um, you changed your therapist as well, right? And as I understand, you had several therapists, but you had the feeling that none of them were taking you seriously or the concerns that you had about the environment. Yes, that's true. So I went to another therapist, this time a neuropsychologist. She was very good, very kind, uh, also very helpful. But also I could never address this kind of climate anxiety or this my grief also for the natural world that I feel. And I remember when I had a walk in 2010, I saw there was a road and it was uh, in the spring and it was full of toads migrating to the next pond and that was just wonderful and a few years later there are no toads anymore and um well i tried to address this topic but they would have always refocus on my personal so how does that make you feel what does it do to you and i'm I, i'm trying to say the point is this culture is destroying the planet and toads are going extinct so is there a way we can talk about this and in therapy apparently you cannot so what were you hoping to get out of this discussion or what were you hoping to get out of your therapist? At the very least, I was hoping for somebody who could understand me and say, okay, you're right, this is insane and we should do something. But even that didn't happen. Everybody wants to stay on denial. Nobody wants to really face this problem. But is that? And is I think that, that's yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. But but is that is that really true? Don't you don't you feel that things are changing? That people are waking up and and measures are being taken? Honestly, well, no. Maybe people are waking up. That could be, but they are waking up and then um, they are demanding probably more solar and wind, and that's a whole another topic that will not save us. But that's also a form of denial. So, the industrial economy is destroying the planet. And what you do as a solution is more industrial economy. So that will not work. This is my understanding as, as a radical environmentalist. So if, if, if we come back then to, um, because as I understand, you discontinued therapy uh, when the pandemic started in 2019. Yes. Yes. And um, things improved for you then, right? Because I mean, I think for a lot of people during the pandemic, they had more psychological issues, but for you, it was different. Yes, I mean, things happened in my personal life I got to know my wife and I was spending a lot of time in nature always. So what really helps is spending time in nature. So this is really a very, very important therapy for me. And I spent as, as much time outside in nature as I can. Yeah, because that's what we all have to get back to at some point to understand that nature is what keeps us alive. Nature is producing our oxygen, it's producing the topsoil, it's producing the clean water, basically, the cycle and so on. So we cannot destroy nature, we are part of nature. So we have to go back. And to me, this is really the best therapy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But at the same time, what's kind of interesting, um, the, when you had your first child, it, it plunged into depression, because you, you felt the responsibility way down on you. Uh, you're expecting another child now. And yet you're more optimistic about, you know, the future. But at the same time, you're also saying that, you know, we're destroying nature and that, you know, green energy is also destroying nature, that we're on a trajectory to destroy nature and ourselves. I mean, why would you have a child in this setting? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. So from a political viewpoint, I was always against having children. But from a personal viewpoint, I just I couldn't... Um, couldn't help they would just come um uh, as my mom says you cannot control life and death and i believe somehow that my children i don't know it's just my belief and i might also be wrong but i have the feeling they wanted to come and 
I'm not actually more positive that the culture is still destroying the planet and it's there's no sign that it's will ever stop and there's no solution in sight. So I'm still very negative in that regard, but I'm I think I'm just stronger. I became stronger. I became stronger because I had I I have a very good relationship with my wife. I'm stronger because also because of my activism. Basically you can do three things, I think. You can stay in denial, which means you deny facing the severity of the situation. Mm -hmm. You can plunge into depression and stay there, or you can go into action. And that's also a therapy. At least I do something. Mm -hmm. At least I, you know, I fight for the lives of my children and I'm not passive. Boris, thank you very much for your time. And uh, oh, and good luck with the baby. I hope everything goes well and uh, yeah, that you have a, a, enough sleep uh, before the baby arrives <laughs> so, that you, so that you're ready. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care, Boris. Thank you. So Boris actually managed to channel his eco-anxiety into activism and at the same time becoming a father again. Um, yeah, that gave him that sort of added motivation to fight for the environment. Um, this is just, of course, you know, one example. And for some of you out there, it might be too radical an example. And uh, Boris's outlook might also be too dark or pessimistic. But uh, personally, I thought Boris was a particularly interesting example because he developed eco-anxiety at a very early age, you know, and before it was widely acknowledged or even had that label eco-anxiety. And I think part of the problem for Boris was also that he felt alone and isolated with his fears. But um, today, eco-anxiety is far more widespread and people are also way more open to talk about it. So let's just bring back Patrick and Megan at this stage uh, to find out a bit more about the ins and outs of eco-anxiety and how we can turn this into something good. We know that people in their experience in climate anxiety might also be you know, experiencing insomnia, they might be unable to concentrate, it might be affecting their work as well for, 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 for adults. It's quite a common reason people might contact us is they find really struggling to, to engage in their work. Um, you know, panic attacks, you know, again, sort of secondary problems, low mood, etc. Mm -hmm. Then it might be time to, to reach out to somebody just as you would, you know, with any other sort of psychological difficulty, if you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just sort of just wondering if I'm suffering from climate anxiety, how damaging is it? To my psyche, you know, if people around me um, don't take it seriously and say, you know, ah, come on, just pull yourself together, you know, snap out of it and, you know, just get on with it. These often are people who probably would also not view depression as a real sickness and sort of say, oh, I was just trying to get off work, you know. Um, I mean, how do we deal with these sort of people and these reactions? Uh, I've just, I'm going straight back to you mentioning sort of the divide and the polarization between the psychological services in your area. It's it's interesting and it's an interesting question. Um, I guess in our early work, we were really struck by people asking, well, is this actually a mental health disorder? And we're like, if people are suffering, that sort of is a reason enough for us to get involved and to try to help as many people as possible. So I think, you know, for, um, you know, for, to have the privilege of having sort of that that support, whether it's online or um, in your community, that's fantastic. And for those who don't, um, you know, it's really important that we, you know, we look to what culturally within their own communities can support them. I mean, we'd be the we'd be the first psychologist. We'd be the first to say, seeing a psychologist is by is by no means the only way of managing psychological distress. You know, and there are so many ways of connecting with this. You know, whether it's about taking action or whether it's about speaking with people around the issue whether it's or whether it's just about learning more about climate change or whether it's just more about kind of taking yeah taking breaks from climate change maybe it's about kind of equipping communities to to fit with more kind of adapt adaptation and resilience to the physical effects of climate change you know there are all kinds of different ways that we can approach this without saying oh you're anxious about the climate you need to see a psychologist mm -hmm. you know that's mm -hmm. that's a very yeah. myopic idea and we'd be the first to admit that i think given that this is is um is a phenomenon and that it that it is growing. I mean, is there any concern there at all that there might be also an element of contagion? That, um, you know, climate anxiety could become a bit of a trend because if you haven't got it, you don't really care about the environment? We've had, Yeah, I've, I'm just thinking about people we've had in workshops or who've worked directly with who have said, I this is really important, but I, I don't, I'm not feeling anxious in the way that you're describing <laughs> i think we're a perfect example of that actually i i feel much more sort of the climate emotions and and i've 
kind of gone through the processes more where you you sort of I don't know you don't seem to be as numb, uh, you're numb. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you know we again again for us it's really been about um, okay so this is what we're dealing with how can we be most effective mm-hmm. how can we um, support as many people as possible and have the biggest impact so again when I'm feeling that anxiety I kind of get into work and that really that that helps me process those emotions mm-hmm. in, in a way that's productive yeah in in the book we talk there's a sub chapter we talk about feeling okay to feel okay we're all in this for the long run we have to be able to get satisfaction and enjoyment from our lives despite this crisis being there and ever present it sounds like what you're maybe touching on there with the contagion idea is the fact that actually you know and and we've certainly seen this in some circles actually people might feel a sense of guilt like oh, I, actually I went out and you know went for a walk with my kids this weekend and I and I was just really enjoyed myself but I wasn't taking any sort of climate action I wasn't directly engaged I wasn't you know and I, and I was enjoying myself is that okay am I, am I allowed to enjoy myself at the same time and I think we have to you know it's essential we've taken a lot of inspiration we've included some included some sort of contributors and voices from the youth climate movement in the book and i'd say it's fair to say gen z are really leading the way in terms of this idea of balance again about about kind of balancing action and self-care, self-care yeah. yeah and you know you see a lot of really prominent youth youth climate activists on you know, instagram and on social media not not seeing they're saying yeah, actually you should all be really fine about this mm-hmm. and they're also saying things like actually it's okay to enjoy yourself. It's okay to, to lean into what is nourishing for you rather than depleting for you. And and they're also really good at calling out the fact that this isn't the problem of the individual. It's like we are all part of a system, but it's actually the wider systems that have created this. And so it, that sort of helps a, a lot of them, I think, remo- remove that guilt, remove that self blame, remove that. And yes, they you know they don't they're not compliant complacent at all, but they have sort of taken that step back and noticed that actually it's the fundamental flaws in the bigger picture that they can then feel that motivation to push against. And I think that that's really self-protective as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to see, you know, kind of young climate activists, half a million Instagram followers, you know, saying something like, actually, I need to switch off from this now for, you know, I'm I'm going to, I'm going to be gone for a week because this week needs to be about me because I need to do the long I, work. I need to do the long work. I need to rejuvenate myself. I need to enjoy my life a little bit, you know, yeah. and that's incredibly, incredibly powerful message yeah. because, you know, like you said, we, we don't want everyone to feel like, you know, I have to feel anxious about this all the time. You know, that's, we don't want that at all. But the aspect of fear and also you as parents, you're a couple, you have kids, I have kids. A lot of people listening to this, I, I assume that have kids. Um, nobody wants their children to be afraid. I have three kids aged five to nine. And so far, my wife and I, we haven't addressed just how severe the climate crisis is. Um, you know, they are aware of certain things because we discussed them at the table. Like, you know, we've explained to them why we don't want to eat so much meat. Uh, we've explained to them why we haven't got any palm oil products. Um, and they understand that, you know, if, if we put it in sort of very simple terms like, you know, palm oil, the monkeys lose their home. We don't want the monkeys to lose their home. The kids understand that. And then they'll, they'll back it up all the way. You know, they're, they're with that. But uh, yeah, we just didn't want to go any deep because we were sort of worried that we might develop um, or stoke, yeah, potential anxiety disorders in the kids if if we if we go deep on this, um, if we give them too much information. I mean, what do you say? Should kids up to a certain age, you know, be allowed to just simply enjoy childhood without, you know, the burden of of, of the climate crisis, or um, is this something we have to address ASAP and as early as possible with kids? I think again, again, we're back to striking that balance. And I think what you've done is really um, is really good because uh, you're giving age appropriate information, but you're also giving um, actions that they can take to have agency in it. So actually it's important to me that the monkeys have a habitat. I'm happy to not have palm oil. Let's not have those cookies. I'm fine with that. So actually you're empowering them um, to have that green identity. And again, really just getting kids to love nature, to feel completely engrossed in nature and in awe of nature is a great place to start because they'll protect what they love. And when there's that sense of connection to a place, you know, or a connection to a species or a connection to, for you, it's your connection to your children, we we really are motivated to protect it. And rather than that coming from a place of fear, 
if we anchor to the value of love or stewardship, that actually gives us those positive climate emotions that can really help us sustain that long-term action that we need. And so when we're dealing with children, it's important to give age-appropriate information, but also balance with positive information and positive stories. Hmm. So you don't want to give them, this is the monster. It's like, this is the monster, but this is how we um, are going to approach the monster. And this is what these people are dealing, you know, doing to deal with this monster. So it, it's more of a um, rounded conversation rather than just fear and walk away we have a sort of three to one rule often with uh, when we're working with educators and saying for every piece of negative information climate wise can i go uh, arrive into that conversation preloaded with with three counterbalancing pieces of uh, either good news or or things that are solution focused look at how we all took action to begin closing the hole in the ozone layer banning cfcs and that sort of thing you know actually there are wonderful examples and we don't want to be overly optimistic here but there are wonderful examples around the world of technological advances of people coming together of people finding solutions to this al gore says the one of the favorite, our favorite things that al gore says is you know i believe the re- the sustainability revolution is unstoppable you know such a power in that message and so actually like megan said this is an area for kids to feel empowered you know kids aren't necessarily frightened by frightening things they're frightened by frightening things they don't know how to control or what they can do about it's the uncertainty that drives a lot of fear and anxiety in kids and so mm. actually if they if they feel like they can play their part if they feel like they can make tangible differences it's incredibly relieving of anxiety a lot of the youth climate groups now are starting to say actually we want this to be embedded into our curriculum sustainability climate change not just in as you know in our science lessons or as a one-off we want this to be incorporated into pretty much every subject we have at school because what what we want is to enter the adult you know the working world Mm. with a a thorough grounding in in, an understanding of climate change sustainability what we can do given that the green economy is going to be so massive when it comes to our kids leaving school it's also really interesting just sort of expanding on that of um, of just the intersectionality of the climate crisis and how it's an afterproduct of colonialism and actually teaching that in schools as well. And it's a whole systems accountability process that needs to happen and needs to take place. And so educating kids as much as we can about the full picture hmm. um, is, is really essential. And I think, again, that's another point where um, young activists are really shining light on so much of the broken systems that are responsible for this our kids and your kids are similar age by the sounds of it and they're therefore you know, mid childhood sort of age they're prone to this kind of magical thinking you know they might sort of have one piece of information over here and another piece of information over there and they might make quite fantastical links between them um and that that's a really helpful thing if you sort of you know parents out there oftentimes thinking actually okay fine they're going to be exposed to this they're going to they're going to learn about climate change if they haven't already how can I have that conversation with them? A really nice place to start is just to ask that question. Actually, tell me what you know about this, you know, and be curious with them. And what you might find is actually they may have had, we've had some wonderful examples of yeah. kind of little bits of fantastical thinking. Little... Oh, I hate smokers. They're causing, they're causing global warming. <laughs> oh, we need to, we need to talk about that a little bit more. <laughs> um, but also it's a, it's a great time. It's a great time for parents to normalize the emotional aspects of this too. It's like, oh, and how, how does that make you feel when you see people littering? I get, I get really, oh, it makes me so angry. I feel really angry about that. But what I do is then I go and as a family, let's do a litter pick this weekend. And let's get our friends doing it too. And then they can see that localized action and taking place. But also you're just normalizing that green identity again. As I was reading your book, um, there was also a graph that depicts um, the scale of emotions that people may have when it comes to the climate. And it had listed in it, you know, for instance, eco-anxiety, eco-rage, eco-grieving. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because it reminded me of uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, very famous speech at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? 
Now, this speech received very different responses, uh, or varied responses, you know, ranging from it being historic, a wake-up call. You know, some said it was like a Martin Luther King moment. And others, you know, uh, more on the troll side, suggested that Greta had mental health issues and needed counselling because it was just way over the top. Um, I mean, what's your take on this as psych- psychologists? I think it's representative of, of you know, we talk, you mentioned eco-rage. We know that if you, you know, looking at the kind of the range of emotions that people might experience in relation to climate change, that's definitely one, but particularly for young people, you know, particularly mm-hmm. for, you know, and... They- there's a real anger towards governments and there's a real anger towards corporations who um, have basically, and and earlier generations who have left us with this mess. And I think, again, it's it's also about, um, you know, strong emotions we've been told to sort of push down for a long time. You know, it's, it's kind of keep calm, carry on identity that we've had and um, sort of in our cultures that, um, that keep this sort of narrative afloat that that's, that's not an acceptable emotion when in fact, wanting to live on a planet that's habitable is, I think that's completely valid and worth getting upset about and mm. getting furious about. And um, and the thing about, you know, that is she's matching that emotion with action. And I think that that's really important. Um, so I think, you know, it's fine to make people uncomfortable about the fact that we are in a crisis. And again, it's, it's really back to normalizing those emotions. Mm. I think but at the same time, we don't have to be experiencing eco rage in order to be effective and to make a difference. And I think one of the things that we're hearing time and time again is that there are just there are just so many ways of approaching this problem of mm. climate of the climate crisis, whether you know approaching it at an emotional level as well as an action level. So actually, for some people, yeah, eco rage is a real motivator for action, just as climate anxiety would be a motivator for action. For some people, actually, they might not be necessarily experiencing these kind of strong emotions. In response to the climate crisis but they they have an awareness of what they need to do and they do it mm. or um, they're feeling quite positive emotions they're feeling really optimistic really connected to um the people that they're doing their climate work with they're feeling really proud of themselves that's okay too it's it's it, but again everybody has a role to play in the climate crisis and everyone you know we don't need everyone furious we don't need everyone feeling guilty we need everybody feeling what gets them motivated in a balanced way there truly isn't one approach to this but obviously it goes without saying that you know Greta Thunberg has captured so so much of the youth experience of this you know of course we're we're very thankful for that. The I mean psychologically speaking I'm also I mean the the, the empathy is also something that comes up in your book quite a lot and I, I mean I'm just sort of thinking somebody who has empathy with the environment with also the climate refugees with with what is really happening who's really connected to nature and you hear all these, you know, stats, you know, the, the species die off. Uh, the, the, you see the oil spills, you see the forest fires, you see all these pictures. I mean, for me, I don't know, I, th- I think that reaction is probably quite normal, um, that you would get really angry if you have that amount of connection and that amount of empathy. But I'm sort of wondering, what does it say about the people who don't feel that way? Um, are they not connected enough with nature or, or are they lacking? Or, or is I think there's a high polarity in our world that we live in right now. And, um, you know, there, because people have become so polarized and the environmental crisis has become a political issue, um, there are a lot of defenses that act up into place when this happens. And so um, if people identify as, for example, um, sort of more more Republican or, you know, it becomes, or more left wing. It's like, actually it's us against them. It becomes an issue of politics rather than, um, you know, a science-based fact. And when that happens, people want to anchor onto their identities and to what the people in, and hold up the status quo of the people around them. And so rejecting things like the impact of the fossil fuel industry or my individual rights or that sort of thing. I think that that, um, it, a that beca- taxation, yeah, like that. a taxation it's, it's like, actually that becomes, um, really, um, there's a dissonance in how they live their lives and what they need to do to engage with it. And that I think is is an interesting, um, it's interesting for us because the psychological communication aspects of um, the climate crisis is something that can really be harnessed in a positive way because we know that the polarity in Britain, for example, there was a study where um, people that were highly climate concerned, people that you know didn't really buy it, they all came together and agreed that everybody loved David Attenborough. And, <laughs> 
And then suddenly we're like, well, why? Oh, because he shows us how beautiful this planet is and how amazing it is. Or, um, and so suddenly it's like, actually, when you can find connections with people, that's where we realize that we're not all so different. And then we can engage more openly in discussions hmm. and then hopefully climate action. There's a lot to be said for, you know, we talk about climate change having an image problem. There's been always been an issue around how it's been talked about and communicated. And that oftentimes we might think within families or, you know, with our friends, it's something that we can't, you know, it's a political hot potato. We don't want to bring that to the dinner table. And, you know, I think that that's what kind of maintains this, this kind of issue, but actually, you know, again, it's, it's about, you know, as humans, we love stories. You know, it's all about what, what stories are we telling about this? Are we talking about this as, as being an issue that's distant, you know, it's far away from our front door? And also kind of the actions that I need to take, the natural world that I'm preserving is also very distant. It's way away from me. Actually, we want to bring those stories closer to everybody. We want to bring, you know, make this feel real, make this feel tangible, but also not do, to find that balance again of not doing it in such a terrifying way as to make people feel disempowered. Yeah. You know, so to also try to keep those stories solution focused as yeah, well yeah the solutions i mean the, the people that i mean basically the bottom line is um as i understand it also from your book the, the way to get out of this or the way to harness it in a positive way is to take action and also mm -hmm. to seek like-minded people and try and change something for the better and it's it's something that we can all achieve if if we try um having said that <laughs> we're, and, and nobody's perfect right and um i mean i know Anybody trying to change their behavior will experience setbacks somewhere along the road, right? It's also something you go into your book. It's, it's part of the course. I've been training for half marathon for about two years and I still haven't run it. Um, so, but, but how do you deal uh, with those setbacks? You know, when, when bad habits take over again and you might feel a sense of, of shame, you might feel a sense of guilt, um, and it might, yeah, it might just put you off. You know, you feel you failed. How do you bounce back? I think, I think what we need to recognize is um, that it, we have to give up the myth of perfectionism in our climate work, because for one thing, it really puts that focus on the individual. And this is not the problem of the individuals. This is, again, part of that systems problem. So giving up the myth of perfection, we don't need one person doing climate work perfectly. We need millions of us doing it imperfectly. And when you have those setbacks, when something you've set out to achieve fails, it's holding yourself accountable for where you didn't show up, looking at why you didn't show up with curiosity. Was it because I wasn't you know, giving myself that self-care? Did I put too much on my list of things I needed to do? You know, Oh, I meant to save the planet on Thursday and I totally missed my deadline. It's like, actually we can't, <laughs> we can't do that. And, and so it's setting you know, achievable goals, working with others to achieve them and you know, just keep moving forward because it's, you know, we, <laughs> we use the metaphor for it's funny you brought that up of the climate marathon as this being something that is it's a long road and we've got those mile markers on the way to signal to us how we're getting on through it um we're running it alongside other people we're keeping ourselves nourished you know i'm a coach i love a metaphor so this is one that keeps going but um but you know it's really important to celebrate when we have those successes and just keep getting back up for more and keep keep going really i mean people you know if be able to ride the, the wave of a setback if you like it's it's, it's helpful to keep a long-term view in, in mind you know we don't want to become too embroiled with the kind of with the short-term failure of the setback if you know like, i don't like the word failure but you know that's how it feels mm. um so just just keeping your sort of long term actually where am i going with this <clears throat> also on a very practical level keep a list somewhere of the things you've done already as humans we're amazing at discounting all of the changes we've already made in fa you know in favor of paying a lot of attention to the thing that isn't quite happening and as a result of that, you know, we, we end up just, we end up making these changes in our lives and affecting change around us without giving ourselves the credit for it. Hmm. You know, so if you feel that dejection, if you feel that set, that setback, just grab a pen and a piece of paper, you know, write down five, five things you've done since you found out about the climate crisis. You know, what changes have you made? Mm -hmm. How have you affected change in your community? And I'll bet, and I'll bet there's more there than we give ourselves credit for. Okay, I can hear our listeners uh, looking for pad and pencil as as, you, as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Patrick Kennedy Williams, clinical psychologist, and Megan Kennedy Woodard, climate coaching psychologist from the group Climate Psychologist. Thank you very much for sharing your time and your expertise. And uh, yeah, your new book it's called Turn the Tide on Climate Anxiety. Practical examples in it, questionnaires, all sorts of tips. It's really helpful. Um, I can certainly recommend it. Yeah, many thanks, Patrick and Megan. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Neil. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Bye now.
Okay, so time for my main takeaways from this episode. First off, eco-anxiety is a perfectly natural reaction to an existential threat. You're not sick if you have it. So there's absolutely no need to feel ashamed about it. You're certainly not alone wherever you are right now. But uh, as Megan and Patrick pointed out, if it starts taking over your life and impacting on your work, if you know your sleeping patterns or if you're having panic attacks or it affects your well-being, it does make sense to seek professional help on this. Um, I also thought it was very interesting that both Patrick and Megan highlighted just how positive social media was in this context, um, that it can bring people together and galvanize groups into action, uh, which seems to be the most single, uh, single most effective measure, you know, uh, to getting on top or, or harnessing your eco-anxiety, taking action. Um, I also like their advice for how to talk climate change with children without scaring or traumatizing them. Um, as Megan mentioned, you know, helping to empower your children with the proper dose of information mixed with solutions and action. And also that um, uh, three to one rule that Patrick mentioned about how for every bit of bad information, you bring three positive aspects to the table. Um, that's certainly something that's stuck with me and I will be applying with my kids in future. And um, Actually, on that note, I think that's maybe also something that Boris lacked as a as a child when he was confronted, you know, with all these bad news and these 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 horrible images of of eco destruction. Um, yeah, I think maybe maybe the input for Boris was perhaps too one sided. I also um, liked how Meghan and Patrick said it's okay to feel okay despite the climate crisis. That you don't have to feel guilty all the time, and that you shouldn't be too hard on yourself if. You sometimes feel that you're falling short. Um, perfectionism is really not healthy in this context. I thought that was also a very strong message. And that you need to find time and space for yourself as well as for your mental hygiene, time in which you can also connect with yourself and nature. And, um, yeah, I mean, that connecting with nature, that's also something that Boris highlighted. Um, so there were parallels there, you know. Boris highlighted that as an important aspect that helped him cope um, with his anxiety and depression over the years. Um, so I think uh, that is definitely something to take away. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I must admit, I, I, I did, I, I really felt for Boris. You know, the chat that I had with him was, of course, much longer than the actual interview that, that you heard. Um, and, you, you know, he told me his, his full story and I could really sense his despair, you know, and also his feeling of, of, of being trapped in a system that is relentlessly destroying this planet. And, um, you know, he does have a very bleak outlook, but uh, I, I do think it's pretty amazing that he managed to turn the corner, you know, despite the pandemic and without any additional therapy. Um, and it's it's great, you know, that he f he's found this new strength with the arrival of his baby and also through his activism. And um, yeah, I, I wish him and his, his family, you know, all the very best uh, for the future. Anyway, that, that, that's pretty much my two cents for now. Um, please do let us know what you think. You can email us at onthegreenfence at dw.com. And uh, yeah, in our next episode, we'll be kicking off a series on water. Um, very interesting topic, so please do join us for that. And uh, by the by, we also publish online articles with each series that we produce. So please do check those out as well at dw.com when you have the time. And uh, yeah, time for me to wrap up now. But first, I'd like to thank my producer and colleague Natalie Muller and my sound engineer Gert Georgi. And as always, a big thank you to all of you listening out there and subscribing and sharing on the green fence. My name is Neil King. Take it easy and take care. Thank <laughs> you.